Austin Space Center. I'm joined here by an incredible group of human beings. Um, to my left, we have uh, Konstantin Borisov, Jasmine Mogbelli, Andreas Mogensen, Satoshi Furukawa, and Laurel O'Hara. So we've got an exciting press conference coming up. We'll be taking questions here in the room on social media using hashtag AskNASA. And if you're joining us on our phone line, go ahead and press star one to answer our question queue or star two to kind of lower your virtual hand if your question's already been asked. I've got my social media questions here, so keep your Ask NASA questions coming at any time. So we're here to talk about um, this awesome crew, Crew 7, and of course Laurel Hara joining us today as well. Crew 7 is launching August 17th at 5.56 a.m. Central Time, 6.56 a.m. Eastern, three minutes after sunrise. And they'll arrive at the space station on August 18th, about 20 hours after their launch. And Laurel's launch will be September 15th at 10.44 a.m. Central Time. We're here to talk about their mission before they go up to space. We have a lot of exciting things happening, including Andreas becoming a station commander in late September, taking over from Sergei Prokopiev. I'm actually going to toss over to Andy for some opening remarks. Thank you, and uh, welcome to everyone uh, to this uh, Expedition 70, uh, Crew 7, and Soyuz press conference. We've got uh, Five out of seven Expedition 70 crew members. We are incredibly excited uh, to be in the final stages, very, very final stages for uh, Crew 7. We have uh, a couple days to go before we enter crew rest and then quarantine prior to our launch on August 17th. And then, of course, uh, about a month after we launch, we look forward to the arrival of Laurel and her two crewmates to the International Space Station and the start of Expedition 70, which will be um, a very exciting and very busy uh, increment on board the space station. We have a lot of uh, science, exciting scientific research and technology development projects that we look forward to uh, for the yeah six months, close to six months that we will be on board the space station. And uh, we look forward to taking your questions today. Thank you, Andreas. Let's get to those questions. Uh, so why don't we start here on the phone with Marcia Dunn? Marsha, if you're speaking, you might be on mute. Hello? We hear you. Marsha? That's okay. Why don't we go to our next question? Can you um, hear? Can you oh, hear now? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry. Yes, I. Uh, um, thanks for taking my question. I'd like to... Just ask the, um, uh, the the crew members who are going to be making their first flights to space. Um, um, tell me, tell me about what led to this. How excited you are, and and um, what you're looking forward to about the space flight. Anything that can just give us a a look into your your mind and your hearts as you're about to go off on this endeavor. Thank you. You want to go? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll start off with that and um, just share that probably the thing that I well that I'm definitely most excited about um, actually launching and getting to space flight is first just looking back and seeing the Earth from orbit. Um, you see it in all these pictures, but actually seeing it in real person, I think, will just be a pretty incredible experience. Um, and then I'm also looking forward to learning how to fly. So learning how to live and work in microgravity, um, you know, just how to do all the daily tasks, um, sleeping and eating and showering, and then uh, using tools and um, equipment to do all of the research that we're going to be doing. Um, and then lastly, I'm looking forward to spending time with these guys um, on orbit and having dinners together and working together and just sharing that adventure. I think for me, um, this is something I've wanted to do uh, for as long as I can remember, and so I know um, recently we've been so busy, sometimes I forget we're actually about to launch the space and just the last couple of days it's really hit me. Um, similar to Laurel, uh, one of the things I'm most excited about is looking uh, back at our beautiful planet. Uh, everyone I've talked to who has flown already has said that was you know, kind of a, a life-changing um, perspective to see, uh, see our Earth in that way. Uh, and also to, to floating around in space, it seems really fun, you know, we've done flights where we get to do that for uh, a 
you know, half a minute or so, but to, to live like that for about half a year, I think will be incredible. Yeah, likewise to that, I can join the same th feelings. Like, I want to experience weightlessness, look at the planet Earth from above. It hasn't hit me yet, which I'm a bit surprised. I know with my brain that we are going to space. But the thing is that, like, the training has been so intense and so hard that, like, it is not psychologically hitting me yet. I'm waiting for that moment. Maybe it happens when we see the rocket or we walk towards the rocket. I'm really looking forward to that. And also, I'm looking forward to coping with all the tasks. You know, this is a very interesting profession. You are preparing for something which you haven't tried yet, and you really want to do it well, but you don't know what it will be. So I'm really looking forward to the adventure, and I'm really excited and honored to do that with these guys. Thank you, Marsha, for your question. Let's now go to Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Thank you. Um, for the members of Cruise, <coughs> excuse me, for the members of Cruise 7, um, though this is not the first time, it's still pretty much a rarity to have four countries represented on one crew launching together. How has been your experience, experience coming together as a crew and working as, as one unit? Uh, it's been incredible. This was something um, when um, I first found out I was flying on Crew 7, I knew it was a possibility for this to be an all international crew. It was something I was really excited about and each one of us uh, have talked. Um, it's, it's something that is very special and important to each of us to just represent um, what, it, what we can do when we work together uh, in harmony. And it's, um, it's one of the things I think we're most proud of is is what we what we represent by being an all international crew. It's a great answer. Uh, now we'll go to Chris Lazarino with the Kansas Alumni Magazine. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Hi, uh, Laurel calling from um, from Lawrence. Everyone here is very excited um, about your upcoming flight. Um, I, I saw on one of your social one of your few social media posts um, a comment. From last February, you were back in Star City, and you commented that you were so excited to be back there. Um, can you talk about that training that you've undergone um, in Star City that made you um, uh, made it so enjoyable for you? And, and you know, uh, just comment on the, the training that you've undergone so far that leads to this point. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and that's exciting to hear from you all the way in Lawrence. Um, yeah, so I started my training in Star City in 20, summer of 2021, and there we uh, start with Soyuz systems. So we study all the different systems of the vehicle, and that moves progressively into more and more complex sims uh, with the crew, where we are in the simulator working through all of the procedures that we will do during launch and docking, and then um, eventually uh, descent and landing. And so those are uh, very fun simulations um, because they're challenging, they throw a lot of different failures at us, and we get to learn how to work through the procedures and work together as a crew. So um, that's been particularly enjoyable. And then, of course, we also learn all of the space station systems. And we do training that's kind of similar to the training that we do here in the U.S. Um, and also at, in Germany with ESA and in Japan. So speaking of hometowns, I have a question on Twitter for Jasmine. Matt wants to know, as a native Long Islander, what ways are you planning on engaging with those here while you're in orbit? Yes, yeah, so um, a couple months ago, I actually went back home to Long Island and spoke to several of the students there from my hometown, from the elementary school all the way to the high school. And we actually have an aviation museum there, the Cradle of Aviation Museum. I went, I went there and spoke to a, a lot of students there as well. And I'm hoping to continue that while I'm on orbit, um, meeting with those same students and, and talking to them from space this time. We'll go back to questions on the phone with Lenka White with Sputnik News. Uh, thank you very much to all of you, and I wish you good luck. Uh, please, I would like to ask you if each of you could name your favorite experiment you are looking forward to the most. Thank you. Favorite experiment? Uh, so I have um, a couple experiments. I don't know if they're my favorites, but it's certainly two experiments that I'm very much looking forward to because uh, they both involve sitting in Cupola, our window module, 
and taking photos out of uh, Cupola. And uh, any time you get to spend time uh, even working in Cupola is a great time because it really is uh, an incredible place uh, to look down at our beautiful planet but also out into space. Uh, and so one of the experiments involves taking uh, photos of giant lightning strikes, what we call blue jets and red sprites. These are a special type of lightning that shoot upwards from the top of thunderclouds up towards space. Uh, it's a continuation of an experiment I did on my first mission in 2015 where I filmed a, a blue jet pulsating in the upper atmosphere. And so this is a, a continuation of that. And then there's a second experiment to take pictures of the moon in order to measure uh, Earth's albedo, so the amount of sunlight that the Earth reflects into space, uh, which uh, is an important parameter when we talk about modeling Earth's climate. Uh, so it's certainly two experiments that I look forward to, especially because they uh, take place in Cupola. No one uh, that I'm really excited about, which we may get to do, um, some members of our crew may get to do while we're up there, is um, actually conducting science during a spacewalk and swabbing the outside of stations for a microorganisms uh, spacewalk, swabbing outside of different vents and seeing is there any uh, life that has persisted on the outside of the space station. Uh, so I think, I think that will be really cool. Well, speaking about those two, one or two experiments, one of the most exciting to me is the quail egg experiment. That's an experiment in which we are carrying a lot of quail eggs, around 30 of them, and we have a special incubator which has two chambers. In one, you have artificial uh, G-force, another one is just a shelf, and every day you have to take care of those eggs, seeing that the conditions are fine, and each day you take one from each and send them to Earth. You fix, you fix them first and then you send them to Earth, and that will tell us how it develops in space and we'll be able to distinguish what are the effects of zero-g and radiation versus different conditions for quail eggs and development. And that's interesting because in the uh, next generations of human space flights we need protein and quails are a good source of protein so we might know how they develop in space and whether we can do that or not. Now uh, that's exciting thing in terms of science and exciting thing, uh, experiment in terms of the way to conduct it, I think it's the hardest for me, is ultrasound examination of internal organs. That's the one which took so much time training, like we are, mm -hmm. me and Nikolai, we are trained, and Oleg as well, to do ultrasound to each other, and we'll do it on the first week, like then after two months, and then we'll do it after we return home, home and we'll see how our internal organs are changing throughout the long duration space flight. Uh, okay, let, let, me, let me introduce a protein crystallization experiment uh, under zero gravity. Uh, under zero gravity, we can uh, get better quality protein crystal, crystals. Uh, after bringing it, it back to Earth and analyzing it, uh, we can know the 3D detailed structure of the protein crystallization crystals. And that the uh, reaction site of a protein is just like a keyhole. And uh, using a computer, you can find a key that best fits the keyhole, which is a candidate for a new drug. So uh, by doing this experiment, uh, we can enhance the development of new drugs. I'm very excited. And one experiment that I'm really excited about, um, because I'll be very involved in it, because I actually am the experiment, is called Cypher. And that is a relatively new um, medical research experiment that takes uh, 14 different studies covering everything from bone and joint health to, um, to, my, to cognitive performance. So how I learn to, how my brain learns to live and adapt in a 3D environment versus, you know, usual 2D environment. And so um, that's been super interesting. Um, it's very new. Um, all of the different experiments will share the data. And so hopefully, um, from that kind of experiment, um, because they're also looking at astronauts throughout different mission durations from, you know, three or six month durations all the way up to one year missions, uh, we'll be learning how the human body adapts to the microgravity environment and that will help inform um, our future missions to the moon and beyond. We'll take a question on the phone line now from Will Robinson Smith of Spaceflight Now. Yes, hi, thank you for taking the time to take our questions today. 
Uh, if we can go back down the line, uh, what's a personal item that you're looking forward to bringing on station with you, and uh, why did you choose that one? Thanks. Personal was there a which would second part to that question? Did it get, get cut off, or was it just what's our favorite personal item we're going to bring? Uh, what personal item you'll be bringing? Um, Will Robinson Smith, was there a second part to your question? Uh, just, uh, you know, how did you happen to choose that item given that, you know, you're limited on what you can bring up with you? I mean, I could start. <laughs> I, um, I'm not bringing a ton of personal items. I. Uh, but I am bringing uh, photos of friends and family, so I'm looking forward to just having those, uh, to be able to look at those and um, hang them up at my crew quarters and also uh, take photos of them in the cupola. I'm just struggling to pick uh, one thing to talk about, but <laughs> I'll go with, I'm bringing um, two uh, stuffed animals for my uh, twin girls, uh, dragon stuffed animals. They're um, the same dragon, but slightly different colors for each of them. and. I introduced them uh, to these dragons before, and then I said, okay, now we gotta box them up to pack them for space. And so I'm looking forward to uh, showing them the dragons floating around in space. I have many items, like, of course, I think almost all of us have the friends and family photos, but I also have my son's first toy, which I want to bring to space and then return to him as a present. That's a big thing for me to bring it, make photos, and then return it back for us to keep it as a family item. These are all so sweet. <laughs> I, I don't know if it qualifies as a personal item, but uh, my uh, Crew 7 colleagues let me pick our zero G indicator. Uh, so traditionally, we always have a, some kind of toy or stuffed animal uh, hanging from the hatch in the capsule uh, to indicate the moment that we reach zero G and it begins to uh, float in weightlessness. And um, you can't tell them what it is, yet, right? <laughs> oh, I can't. It's a surprise. <laughs> it's a surprise. Okay. Well, so that's probably. I'll have to tell you the story uh, and what it is at a later time. <laughs> But Andreas, you did you pick the item? I did. I get I got to pick the item together with my children. I have three children, and so it's it's related to them. But I'll have to keep it a surprise <laughs> a little bit longer. Well, uh, in addition to the photos of families and friends, I am bringing a, a, some photos of, of uh, from the students of the of the schools that I graduated from, and I'm looking forward to taking photos with them. Oh wow! Awesome. Now we'll go to Bill Harwood with CBS News. Hey, thanks very much. This is a question for Laurel, if I can. Can you talk a little bit about, I guess you're launching with one crew and coming down with another. So Oleg and Nikolai are going to stay up for a full year, I guess. And can you talk about how that might have affected training in any way with you, if it has at all, and just what their attitude is going into a flight like that? Thanks. Um, yeah, that hasn't impacted our training, and that's still going through the process, the um, approval process. So that hasn't impacted us at all. Right, not completely confirmed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I'm going to try on this name. Please excuse me. Yuichiro from Kyoto News. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my question is to Fukawa-san. <clears throat> In coming years, uh, more and more people will go to space, but I think the risk of the space trip on the human health or body is uh, not fully really understood. So as a uh, medical doctor, uh, how do you think you can contribute to the enhancement of knowledge through this mission and beyond? Uh, would you please uh, uh, specify one or two topic you are focusing on? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, well, uh, as Laurel discussed, uh, I am also a subject for the Cypher experiment, and uh, uh, it is a uh, big 14 research, uh, combination of the 14 research project, and it is for the upcoming uh, long duration uh, human stay in space. And uh, we can, uh, the, I will be uh, giving kind of data before, during, and post-flight for uh, blood, urine, uh, 
PC-based test results, something like that, to better know how the uh, space environment affects uh, human body uh, in prep for the upcoming uh, human expression to the Mars, uh, to the Moon, Mars, and beyond. And so uh, I'm very uh, excited and looking forward to that. We'll take a question from Elizabeth Howell with Space.com. The time this question is for Andreas. Do you have any tips for other astronauts for taking pictures of the auroras from the space station? And also, um, what are you most looking forward to in terms of imagery? Uh, in terms of advice, practice, 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 <laughs> because it it uh, it is tricky to get good photos. Uh, but luckily. You know, we have uh, half a year uh, to to get good at it. Uh, on my first mission, I had 10 days, uh, so it was a little bit tricky to to take a lot of good photos. Um, but I'm hoping this time, with six months, uh, I'll have more uh, more time to spend out in the cupola and to to get much better. Um, and I'm I'm looking so much forward to getting back to the space station. It really is an incredible place, um, and just living and working up there uh, with my colleagues. Uh, is such a fantastic opportunity. And of course, I'm also looking forward to, to getting to do a lot of things I didn't get to do on my first trip uh, because it was a, a shorter trip. Uh, I didn't get to see a, a lot of things on the Earth. I never saw the Himalaya Mountains. Um, you know, I never saw uh, what's called the Richat structure in the Saharan Desert. I never saw a lot of the other craters that you can see on, on Earth uh, from space. And so, I'm looking forward to seeing that and hopefully taking some good pictures. And then I have a, a personal project uh, where I'd like to, to take, try to recapture some of these blue jets again and uh, also photograph a, a few other places, some, some uh, wild nature areas that are left on Earth. Our next question is from Mikio with NHK. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you for taking my question. So my question is for Furuka-san. I think this is the first time you are in public with other crew members in this press conference. So can you please talk about what you are feeling now with these members and what kind of role you, you'd like to play among these members? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the question. I, I'm very happy and proud of being this incredible team. And uh, in a Dragon spacecraft, I'm uh, serving as mission specialist. Uh, working with commander and pilot and the other uh, mission specialists to keep the the Dragon uh, spacecraft intact. And when it comes to uh, onboard the space station, I'm uh, working as a, in a, a flight as a flight engineer and uh, conducting many scientific experiments and while uh, keeping the the space station in good status. We have a question from social media now from Andrew, who this might be for Crew 7, who wants to know, how do you deal with the long travel to the space station? Uh, long travel to space station. Um, my first flight to the space station in 2015 uh, took 53 hours. So I think it's going to be hard to, to beat that. Anything uh, below that, and I'm going to be happy. <laughs> We'll switch back to the phone line with Manuel with Exploración Espacial. Thank you. How are you? Uh, you just answered my question a few minutes ago regarding your, the personal items that you're uh, carrying with you. But now I'm, I'm curious, um, how the process work? Um, are you giving uh, um, an X amount of weight and you can carry whatever you want, not passing that weight, or is it depending on the amount of items? And, uh, and if the proce process is the same, when you land from Russia or with the Soyuz or, or from, from the U.S. Thank you. Uh, I think it's similar for Russia and for United States commercial vehicles. We are located some weight and we have rules of things which we can and which we cannot take. Like there are things which are breakable. We cannot take glass. We cannot take batteries. We cannot take personal um, electronic devices. And the rest, like if you read the rules, you are pretty sure about what you can, what you cannot. It's similar to what you could take aboard a plane to your hand luggage. Uh, and we allocated personal, like one, one bag. Each of us can fit up to one and a half kilos of weight, sometimes 
more, and I think it's similar for Soyuz, mm -hmm. isn't it? Same. Uh, and we had actually to prepare the list of things long in advance, like mine was ready in April because it had to be checked and sanitized and then checked again and then brought here. So we are talking about something which has already passed and be, been packed and we hope to take that out when we come aboard. Next we'll go to David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Thank you very much. Uh, Jasmine and Laurel, um, you're going to be spending a lot of time together on station. You're getting there very different ways, so your training has taken you apart and you'll be coming back together on station. Have, have you done anything during training um, in your separate locations to stay in touch and set a plan for your stay on station? Um, yes. Uh, so as you probably know, Laurel and I were classmates together. We were selected at the same time, so um, you know, we're very good friends. And um, it's been interesting because a lot of times we've been on uh, opposite sides of the world, so it's been different, uh, difficult to meet up, but more recently we've spent more time in the same country and we spent um, some time in different countries other than the states together during our training. Uh, and so we both keep in touch, um, you know, via text and call just like everyone else and also um, when we are in the same country trying to spend time together. Our next question comes from social media for Constantine. It's a bit of a two-part question from Radio Negative Particles. Do you plan on going on Russian spacewalks? And do you know if there will be any joint ESA Roscosmos uh, spacewalks like the Christopher Eddy Artemiev spacewalk? Yeah, I know. Um, thanks for the question. You know, it's a pity that if you are flying this incredible opportunity to fly in an American US CV, you are not able to do a Russian spacewalk because you have to be paired with someone to do that. And uh, since our crews have been changed so many times, unfortunately I don't have any spacewalks planned. Uh, but although I am completely prepared and I am ready to be a backup and if something uh, goes, back, goes bad I can rejoin the crew and do a spacewalk. But uh, coming to the second part of the question, no, I don't know if there are, I know that there are no joint spacewalks planned for increment 70. You could always invite me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> because you are trained, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> we could we'll do that. switch back over to the phone bridge with Marcy with the International Women's Air and Space Museum. Thank you. Yes, my name is Marcy Frumka from the International Women's Air and Space Museum. And my question is for both Jasmine and Laurel. And I want to know, did you receive any tips or advice from any other women space station astronauts to prepare for living aboard the space station for six months. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we've uh, obviously had a bunch of our friends fly before us, and so um, along with the other women and also the men, we've gotten a lot of advice on everything from, you know, how to take showers in space to also just, um, you know, how to take photos in space. <clears throat> yeah, I think to second that, I think often the advice, um, you know, we learn a lot in our classroom environment, but a lot of the advice that we're getting from um, our friends who have flown before us is often around the day-to-day -day living stuff and things mm -hmm. you just don't think about um, when you're used to working in a 1G environment here on Earth. You don't think about how hard it will be to just do simple things like fold a cloth or wash your hair or go to the bathroom or the, the basic just daily things is probably what I've gotten the most advice about. So getting into the second half of our press conference, I just want to remind everyone if you have a question on the phone to press star one to answer to enter our question queue. And if you've got a question on social media, be sure to use hashtag ask NASA. And of course here in the room, raise your hand if you've got a question. And I think we do have one. Oh, thank you, uh, Mark Corot with Aviation Week and Space Technology. What should the people on planet Earth see in the diversity of the crew that's launching on, seven, on Crew 7, um, but also living and working hard on the space station uh, and the commitment to be there six months, possibly more? Um, I just wonder what you kind of 
and I don't know which person to ask because anyone would be great. I'm just sort of wondering what you think that message is back to us. What do you think? I mean, I could, you know, when, when I launched on my first mission in 2015, uh, as we were approaching the space station and getting ready to dock, uh, you know, when we were 20, 30, 40 meters away and I looked out the window, that was the first time I really understood what an incredible machine we have built in low Earth orbit uh, and what an incredible laboratory uh, and workplace it is. It's really, really impressive to see the International Space Station uh, as you're approaching it. Um, and it just reminded me of what we have achieved together uh, through our international cooperation. And I think if there's something, you know, one lesson that we've learned through uh, the International Space partnership is how important that cooperation ha has been and how much we can actually achieve together when we work together. We have another question here in the room. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Behnud Mokram from VOA Persian. Congratulations to all of you guys. My question is for Jasmine. Jasmine, you are a role model for many Iranian women. You are a fighter, someone who follow her dreams. As you know, Iranian women are fighting for freedom, gender, discrimination, and justice right now in Iran. I know you follow women life freedom movement closely. What is your message for Iranian women? I appreciate that. Um, yes, I've, you know, I've been very lucky in my life to, to have the opportunities uh, I have had, and while it's taken a lot of hard work to, to get to where I am. I didn't have certain barriers that unfortunately others, whether it be in Iran or other parts of the world, have had. And um, I've been really inspired by the fact that the, the women and men uh, in Iran are, are fighting not just for themselves, but for those who come after them. Um, and I, I, hope, I hope to see a day when the same opportunities I've had are, are open for anyone else who um, who wants to put in the hard work and effort and that there are no no barriers in place preventing them from, from doing so. Our next question comes from social media for Andreas. How did the training for the Soyuz and Dragon differ? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, they are, Soyuz and Dragon are two very, very different spacecraft, principally because one Soyuz was developed in the late 60s and, and early 70s, and uh, Dragon was developed in the last 10 years. And so the concept of operations is, is very, very different. Soyuz um, has, in the past at least, relied on ground stations for radio communication, which means that for maybe half of the flight, uh, the uh, astronauts on board Soyuz uh, have to be uh, independent. They have to be able to work independent, which means that any problems that arise during flight, they have to be able to solve on their own. And so it requires uh, an incredibly intricate knowledge of all the systems on board Soyuz. Um, with Dragon, uh, thanks to the Tidris and the ground station network that uh, SpaceX utilizes, we have almost 24-hour radio communication with uh, Mission Control in Hawthorne, which means that SpaceX has a team of engineers and experts uh, sitting at the consoles ready to uh, support us in case anything happens. And so really, if, if problems arise, then uh, we always have the expertise of, of SpaceX available to help us troubleshoot. And so it means that uh, we don't have to be quite as independent uh, as astronauts on Soyuz. So this question from social media was actually asked twice by Abdullah and B, who want to know what some of the major tasks are that each crew member is going to be completing. You want to take it? Laurel, you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, so we'll be doing all sorts of uh, work on board space station. Uh, we have over 
and on any expedition, there's over 250 science experiments going on both inside and outside space station. Uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about, um, because it's also a hobby of mine on the ground, is just uh, fixing things that break. So uh, whether it's the toilet or our galley, um, we're, both, we're the onboard technicians that get to fix all those things, uh, you know, working with the engineers on the ground. And so that's uh, one aspect of our work that I'm really excited about. Did anyone else want to chime in with any tasks, or do we want to move on? Well, I, I mean, I I would uh, agree with Laurel. My first mission in 2015 was a, a short 10-day mission, and I was able to concentrate exclusively on science and technology development. Um, this time, because I'm going to be there for half a year, I also have to participate in all the other activities that uh, are required to maintain the space station. So that's maintenance and repair of all the systems. It's logistic work, you know, emptying all the cargo vehicles that uh, arrive, packing them with trash, uh, potentially also uh, working with the space station uh, robotic arm and uh, perhaps even uh, a spacewalk. So there's a, a lot of other opportunity or a lot of other work that I'll hopefully have an opportunity to perform this time. Thank you, Laurel and Andreas. We have a question here in the room up front. Hi, everyone. Uh, you're going to be on the space station at a really exciting time where you will get to celebrate some holidays. So I would love to hear any plans you have for celebrating or how you'll connect with family and friends back home. Um, I can say it. So for in, in my household, we celebrate uh, both Christmas and Hanukkah. So I've brought um, some items for both to celebrate uh, with my family. You know, I've got a Christmas ornament with a a picture of uh, the four of us together, and also um, my husband and, and little girls helped make a, a felt menorah with uh, lights for each night that I can can pin on uh, to celebrate with them. Um, so uh, I'm excited to do that. I think the biggest celebration for us would be around New Year, like Christmas and New Year. I have a few thoughts I don't want to share with the guys because those are surprises, <laughs> but I think we'll do some crazy stuff around those days, like 25th of December and 31st of December. We cannot wait to see it, especially <laughs> the first sunrise of the Earth on New Year's. That's always so popular to see. Mm -hmm. Our next question on social media is, what food are you looking forward to eating in Zero G? And I'll add my own spin for our international partners if you'll be sharing some of your special treats. <laughs> well, I'd say one of the, you know, one of the bonuses of having such an international crew is the fact that we uh, we have a tradition of bringing food from our home countries. Uh, you know, most of the food is is either American or Russian, uh, but uh, when. A Japanese, a European, or a Canadian astronaut flies. Uh, we have a tradition of bringing some food uh, with us from our home countries, and so I think both Satoshi and I have will be bringing some some food uh, from our home countries to share with the rest of the crew. And I will say, uh, I have also I won't say what, but I have brought some Persian food to share with you all. So mm -hmm. excited to share that. I'm just excited that we have so much food. Like, <laughs> we have over, you know, like we spent, I think, eight days test tasting food all together, both in Russia and here. Mm -hmm. It's so many dishes. I think there are more than 400 things which you have could combine them in the way any way possible, and that's a unique situation in our crew flies, crew flights to to space because it hasn't been the case like 50 years ago and I think that when we go to the moon and beyond and to Mars we won't have that variety of food so we are excited that food is what will provide a lot of interesting emotions and feelings and also uh, my friends tell me that tastes change in space so whatever we think we might want now might change a lot during the flight. So it's exciting just like as a first flyer, it's ex everything is exciting, but the food part is also, I'm very curious how it works. And also my personal thing, answering the previous question, I really think that we should share what's happening to you in the flight, and I'm trying to do that as much as possible through like social media and stuff, because like those first days and first weeks and first months of everything, like psychological things, physiological things, like human interaction, how you cannot do stuff and then one month later you 
make fun of what you couldn't do like one month ago. That's all very exciting. Maybe just uh, you know, one, once in a while we're, we're lucky that uh, there's an overlap between food and science. Uh, one of the science experiments we'll be doing is growing tomatoes in space. <laughs> and uh, you know, if the ground teams, the flight control team, they're really nice, maybe they'll let us uh, eat some of the tomatoes. And so that's, I'm hoping for that at least. That would be nice to get some, some fresh uh, fruits and vegetables in space. This has been my favorite question. Thank you for asking that on Twitter. Uh, we do have a question up here in the room. Hi. So as a team and individually, how have you prepared emotionally and mentally for the challenges of space flight? Good one. <laughs> I can do that. Uh, for me, it's sports, meditation, and yoga. That's what I do, but I don't think it's very easy to make yoga in zero G. I'm really curious how it works. But at least the breathing techniques and things which uh, I do as my daily practice, I can continue doing. Uh, that's one thing. And sports is always what would take your mind off the problem and stress. I think I will be doing running and meditation and breathing techniques. And also, photogra that's what all of my colleagues tell me that. We can take photos of the ground, of the earth, both during the daytime and during the nighttime. And that is something which really takes you away in terms of like, you get distracted, you get into it, you enjoy doing that and time passes and you get uh, like some variety in your day which can help relieve a lot of stress. And also we have friends and family which uh, given the current technology development are one call away. You can always text them, you have emails, you have phone calls, and I'm planning to call my friends and family to talk to them, just to stay there, stay in touch, and share the experience which I'm enjoying. And, and along the line, uh, an experiment NASA astronaut uh, told me a tip uh, that says, uh, train as you fly and fly as you train. So uh, that I think that is very true. So. Uh, on the day of actual flight, uh, you need to do what you used to do in the training sessions, not something spe spe uh, special. So that is a, uh, that is a very good tip uh, to uh, get yourself uh, prepared for a flight. We'll go back to the phone bridge with Robert Perlman from Collect Space. Hi, thanks. Um, for, for all five, um, you'll be on Space Station either a month or, 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 or within a week of OSIRIS-REx coming back to Earth and uh, delivering asteroid samples. Has there been any talk about whether you'll have a view um, from Space Station of that reentry and any particular training for capturing it on film? Mm -hmm. No, no specific talks of that. Um, and I'm not sure if that's something that will need to be determined uh, as we get closer. Um, but, but hopefully if there will be a view, uh, I think the flight control team will certainly prepare us for that um, so that we can capture views, but uh, nothing specific yet. I'm definitely trying to catch Soyuz flight, which is happening on September 15, because when it launches, actually the ISS is very close during the launch phase. It is a short flight, it's a mm -hmm. two, two orbit flights. That means that it will be so close and I really want to try that. Awesome. Going back to questions on social media, this time from Jacqueline. Andreas, I think, already answered that question, so I think I'll toss this one to someone else. What is one place on Earth, excluding your home country, that you look forward to viewing from the cupola? <laughs> it's okay, you can think about it. <laughs> is it to everyone? <laughs> to me, it's uh, Egypt. I really like South Sinai. That's the place where I spend so much time doing free diving. That's where I met my wife. That's where we had so many nice time together. And it's always like there are 330 Sundays during the year. So it may means that you can take photos almost every day. And there are nice places. I want to take pictures of the Red Sea in that area between it's called the Akaba Bay, 
and also there are interesting mountains in the center of Sinai Peninsula. I just love those places. I know them. It's like a second home to me. And I want to take photos of those places and see how they look from, from, from space. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? What are you looking forward to seeing from the cupola? Well, tro tropical islands like oh, okay. Bahama or Pacific Oceans, really beautiful. We look forward to the photos. Yeah. I'll do one last call for questions here in the room. All right, hearing none. Well, to conclude today's press conference, thank you to Crew 7 and Laurel O'Hare for joining us here today. Uh, Crew 7's first on deck launching August 17th at 5.56 a.m. Central Time, 6.56 a.m. Eastern. You can continue to follow their mission as they get ready to go to space as well as their time on the International Space Station on their social media accounts as well as at Space Station as well as our International Space Station blog. Uh, we look forward to continuing to get your great questions as they go throughout their mission. Thank you for joining us.